So we're using um, JoinMap 4.0 for our link, uh, linkage analysis. Somebody could use a, a different mapping program, but this is the one that, that we used. Uh, we had a site license for it at um, Michigan State. So we've now taken the, um, going back to the Genome Studio, we created that report file. This is text file was imported into Excel, and and this is what, what what you see here without our little text up here. Data exporters from Genome Studio. We that's our our little um, note to you there. So this is a screenshot of the X of the Excel sheet uh, with the information. So you can see we've got uh, 96 samples, 92 progeny, and and plus the parents, and then um, 800. 8,303 uh, SNPs. So then there's a lot of da data filtering that, that, that goes on here, the, those things that, we, that I was uh, working through um, to remove the, the, the non-segregating SNPs, the ones that um, the calls that don't make, make sense. So what we've done is taken the file here, the file here, and now we've uh, got the, the two parents um, lined up in the first couple columns. We have the SNP marker and then the progeny going across. You can see all the calls. Up here we gave an, uh, the name uh, for all the, all the different progeny so that we um, uh, can uh, distinguish them. And now we need to do is take this and format it for, for join map. And so what we have to do is actually change the the, the SNP name, it has, there's a limitation in JoinNap on how many characters the SNP, uh, the, the, your locus name can be. So we um, reduce that down. You have to put the type of segregation you're expecting. In this case, it's LM by LL. Uh, that's just uh, uh, something that, that you work with. And then here are the, and you have to convert from the SNP calls of A's and B's to um, to these L, LL versus LM. So just a, some uh, data manipulation that goes on. So I'll say is that what we want to do is in the, sometime in the fall is create some type of workshop, hands-on workshop for people that are interested. There's a lot of people that have done, generated, you know, uh, populations and collected the SNP data. And what we can do is have a workshop where we can all meet at one place and kind of help you work through some of these things if, if you feel you uh, need the help. Okay, so we've got now um, the, the data set ready to go into join map. And so you can see here the individuals are up here. It only says X, but because the file's been collapsed down or the columns have been collapsed down, you don't actually see the name, the name there. We've got the segregation type, as I mentioned earlier. We've got the locus name. Now, you can, you know, call them whatever, whatever you want. And we actually at one time was putting, uh, noting in here which ones we saw had skewed segregation so that we could see how they, how they mapped out. Or we, were, we had them kind of denoted whether they were candidate genes or, or genetic markers just to kind of see where they were all, all kind of falling out. So you can, you know, play around with this. And you know, right now they're just, these are the uh, SNP names we're using, but you could, put some other uh, parameters into that if, if you wanted to. Um, so then here's the uh, array size. So we ended up here, this is the DM by 84SD22. So there's 2,474 markers, 92 individuals. And then the population type is that we use is cross-pollinated. So these are just some of the things that, that, you, um, that we've worked through to you know, get that set up. So now you've run that in join map. And one of the first things that we get is um, we get some segregation data. And so here's our, our SNPs and the progeny are going across. And over here on the, on the um, end here, we, you can see, little, you can, over here you can see the chi-square value. Uh, you can see the, the segregation data over here. So in the ones that we have highlighted in blue, all these were the ones that had you know, a heterozygous parent and a homozygous parent, we expected a one-to-one -one segregation and we had 92 to, to zero, so we removed, removed those. Um, however, we kept in the, you can see the skewed ones here, 
79 to 7, 81 to 11. We, we didn't want to remove them at, at this point yet. Because um, we know if you go into literature that there's a lot of skewed segregation in the diploid populations, especially when there's uh, wild species involved. So another way that you can look at the data is the individual genotypic frequency. So you can see now the progeny here and going across, what it's doing is seeing how many fell into the different homozygous or heterozygous SNP category. And you can see in this last column here, I think is the number of um, missed call SNPs or whatever, the ones where there was no calls. And so if you were seeing some progeny where there were a lot of missed calls, you know, no calls, you might want to consider uh, removing those because maybe, maybe they're not, not that good. Um, so now you want to calculate the co-segregating uh, co SNPs and remove these identical, identical ones. And so that was done and you, see, you can see them sorted here. And, um, and if you look in this column here it says similarity. So all the ones you're seeing are on this screenshot right now are all ones that were at the, at the same, same location. You know, you know, mapped to the same bin. So I think this is kind of an, an in, a point I'll bring up right now is that we had a lot of SNPs, but we only could map so many because in an F1 cross here, you only have so many recombination events with project size of 92. So if we want to see more SNPs mapped, we need a larger population size. But we also be nice is if we had more recombination going on, like like in some of the self-pollinated crops where you can develop recombinant inbreds so you can reduce these, um, these uh, linkage blocks. Um, so now another tool that's in here is you can look at the similarity of the progeny. And so in, we have two, uh, two progeny here, or two, uh, two examples. So progeny 45 and 47 had a had a similarity of one. So um, I think we removed that. Is that what Joe So we, act, we pulled this one out of the population for the analysis because they had identical similarity. I don't know, you know so for, for all the SNPs we looked at, they were identical. Whether they are identical or not, I'm not uh, really sure. OK. Um, and then there was a second one that was very, there was nine, you know, almost nine, it was 99% similarity there. So, uh, well, we kept that one in. So now, uh, this is uh, uh, the process of generating the, the map. And so what we need to do is calculate the groupings. And so um, this, in, what this information gets generated when, when you um, uh, 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 run your file in the join map. And what you're seeing here is the different uh, iterations and what we're looking at is the lot scores and the number of markers that fit into that, into that grouping. And highlighted in red are the 12 um, linkage groups that we, that we chose. So it's, it's not you know, completely clear cut. You have to kind of make some decisions yourself on what, what um, groupings you're going to use to, to generate your, um, your linkage groups. So hopefully you should get, get 12 when, when this is um, this is all done. Okay, so now we go ahead and create the linkage, uh, create the map for the for the linkage groups, and so you can uh, see here. Now we have the, the different uh, SNP uh, locus, and then you have the position, and you can see along the chromosome starting from zero, and it continues on past you know 51 um, centimorgans. And then, which you can then take that data file. Um, and uh, create the, out, the map output for each uh, linkage group. And this is what, what you'll see. It's, oops, that's what you're um, uh, used to seeing. But right, right now, we don't know which linkage, you know, which chromosome this is associated with. So now what you can do is go back and look at the SNPs that you have, go back to the pseudomolecule, and, and, make a, uh, and, and then call that the actual chromosome. And so that's what's, what we have here now is we have chromosomes one to six, you know, associated with the linkage groups, and here from seven to seven to twelve. So that that's the, the process that that we go through. So we've made we've made the map, and we've and so we align them to the to the 
with the pseudo molecules. And what we need to do is look for um, mismatches uh, now. Okay, and uh, take a minute and and uh, and talk about that. It could be that some of these mismatches might be because it's a bad assay, or it could be that there's a paralog that maybe there's this SNP maps to more than one location, and uh, and so here's some examples of um, of mismatches. Um, so the first one here, this looks nice, you know. So uh, if it's a mismatch and it looks right like this, so maybe the pseudo molecule has it in the wrong place, and so maybe. Uh, this is where the concordance between the map, uh, the genetic map, and the physical map can be um, uh, corrected. This is um, a situation where we're looking at the graph here, and we we know that the heterozygotes should map to the or should um, show up in the middle here. And you can see the circle around this is saying that yeah, they're all heterozygotes, but if you look at them, they're clustering into different groups. And so, if you, I'm not going to go into the details of it. But um, we've sat around and kind of did some, some thinking through this. And if there's a paralog, there's going to be some intensity differences, and also which may actually influence some of the segregation differences. And, and, that, and so this may be a clue that we have a, have a paralog. So if you see something like that, you want to uh, uh, be wary of what's going on. And then here, OK, here we have a mis mismatched SNP. But what you have really is a messy data set. So I think this is one where I would go out and throw, throw this one away and, um, and not use that. So he, here's a table that's summarizing the, 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 mis, uh, the, um, the SNPs that were mapped in the two diploid populations. We have the, the pseudomolecule. And so there were, by chromosome, we had 133 in the DRH population that were not mapped in the pseudomolecule, and we had 232 that were not mapped in, in the D84 population. So of those uh, ones that weren't mapped, uh, we had mismatches, uh, um, as you can see, by chromosome. And you can see that on, on chromosome 10, we, we've had seemed to have some large numbers of ones that were kind of mis mismatched. But there's, then there's a scattering around. So we've got the nine there, a 10 there and 9 on chromosome 12. So, there's, um, so by having the two populations here, I think that kind of helps us have a little more confidence on where the, you know, whether it's um, something specific to the chromosome or whether it's just that, as Robin said, we've got a lot of things right in the, in the pseudomolecule, but there's um, some, maybe some orientation issues and things like that. But I think uh, this is kind of helpful in the process. I'm going to stop here at the moment because I think this is kind of the process of going through the the map, the map. and uh, I've got I want to talk a little bit about tetraploid SNPs, but I, I I'm kind of I think this is kind of a, a, a take a couple minutes stopping point here with people who got questions about the the, dip, the diploid mapping, is it is any or any comments or anything along the way, Walter? So Walter's asking about the cost of the of the programs. Um, uh, I, joint map, I think, is is a little pricey. If I'm, I'm and so we have a so Dave is saying about four thousand for for joint map. Hey Dave, I got a question. Okay, so Walter's asking about MapQTL. Dave, what do you have a? So it's a, it's a, so the, about four thousand dollars for the programs. Hey, Dave, this is John. I got a question from online. Okay, I got a question from uh, uh, online. From uh, uh, what do you mean by not mapped in PM? So um, so the question is, what is what about being not mapped in the pseudo molecule? Okay, so the. Um, uh, the, the pseudomolecule, there was a lot of SNPs were chosen based upon their location in the pseudomolecule, but I guess some were not, you know, when it was all said and done, didn't have a map, a chromosome assigned to them. And so in our data file, they, uh, they were unassigned. So we, 
but we still used them because we felt, felt they were good SNPs for var various reasons. Yeah. So, so Dave Francis is saying they could be in some, some gaps in the, in the sequence there. Robin, do you have a comment on that? So I can't completely summarize what, Ro what Robin was saying there, but there was just gaps in, the, in, some, of the, uh, in some of the sequencing because they're coming from some of the transcriptome work and between some of the scaff scaffold work. So it, I, I think it just goes back to the point that the, 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 the genome sequence does have some gaps, and this is help, helping to fill some of those in. Any other questions that you're in, John? I had one that was actually from Robin's talk that I just missed, and uh, someone asked about the, what about the condition that SNFs had to be at least 50 base pairs apart? If you don't want to take that now, it's okay, but that was asked. We'll, we'll come back to your, um, your uh, that, that's an Infinium, des well, actually, it's just an Infinium design question, uh, uh, answer, is that, so you're asking whether this, um, why does, the SNPs have to be 50 base pairs because the, the primers used, I think, are, uh, re require that spacing around there so that we uh, don't have any mismatches uh, um, in the, um, along the sequence data. If we have too many mismatches, we're not going to have the, the primers uh, annealing to the, to the DNA sequence. Thanks. Any other uh, comments or questions at this point? I got one more actually. Hey, uh, John, hang on one minute. So the, the question has come up about the cost of the software. And I think what users have to understand is if you're not locked in to join that, is there are other software mechanisms that you can have to use to remove the base knowledge. One of the options is to keep moving as many boxes as you can. Right? So if you want to remove the join that, then you want to consider. Right. Yes. Yeah. We really needed a microphone for the for the audience here. That's a, a, a point to make for next year for doing this. But so so Dave Francis was commenting about really not being locked into using join map join map software. There's lots of other softwares out there that, that people can can actually use or, or purchase. And there's uh, but you still need to be able to manipulate your uh, you, well you gotta Go ahead and filter your data before you do any of the mapping. Or is that what you're? So the point I'm making though is if you're working with a service provider, okay, then you can work directly with the Excel file to get the information. Yeah. Then you still have to then go through and do some quality control and throw out some more information. Yeah. So if if you're working with a service provider, you know, like uh, there are some uh, private companies that are doing the gene type. That you made, uh, you're going to have to go through and and still go through and filter these out these uh, the data like we're going going through here. Is that what? So, uh, the Genome Studio software I don't think is is outrageously priced. Uh, I don't. I, Dave, Dave Franz is saying it's about two thousand, right? Um, maybe even be fifteen hundred or something in in that range. Um, we we purchased a. a Few site licenses for uh, Michigan State, so we have a, a you know a few copies on our campus. 